you, everybody. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Okay, I'm going to stand here and not behind the podium so I can feel a little more connected to everybody. And I've got some notes here, so from time to time I might have to take a look at them so I don't forget my speech that I'm giving today. Okay, well, my name is Andrew D'Angelo. I'm the founder of Harborside with my older brother, Steve. And before I get into our talk today, I just want to thank Darren and Brandy and the team for putting on this conference. Let's give them a big hand. Feel free to come on down and sit a little closer, everybody, if you like. Cannabis people always like to sit in the back. Uh, I guess that's 100 years of prohibition working on our subconscious. So come on down. We're all together now. This is a nice, intimate group so we can have a, a, a nice, thorough talk. I also owe a word of thanks to my team at Harborside. There's 300 people working very hard in California today, so I can be here with you. So I want to thank them as well. We're only as good as our team. That's so today I'm going to talk a little bit about what I've learned so far in Florida, some of the stakeholder groups uh, here in Florida, and how those stakeholder groups can form a team and whatever stakeholders role is in the program here and how we can make it better. And then I'm also going to share um, our journey with Harborside and, and, and how we were able to over the last 12 years uh, take a program in California that, that didn't exist basically uh, and uh, get us all the way from uh, one municipality having an ordinance and licensing program in Oakland all the way to a, a full adult use legalization in the state of California. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that journey, and I hope that some of those lessons we can transfer here to Florida. Because we have a long way to go in Florida to get full access to cannabis, not just for all the patients who need it, but any adult over the age of 21 ought to be able to access this plant freely uh, in our system. So, so let's see if we can get that done here. But before I get into all that, I'm going to share with you my personal cannabis story. Just about everybody in this room, I'm sure, has a personal cannabis story. Oftentimes it's your own health and your own story that led you to cannabis, and sometimes it's a loved one or a family member or a child or a grandparent or a parent that has benefited from cannabis, and those stories are really what uh, change people from the inside out. My personal cannabis story started when I was pretty young. Uh, I grew up with a lot of trauma early in my life. By the time I was six years old, we had a, a brother, Daniel, who passed away from natural causes. My older brother, Steve, was already getting in trouble with the juvenile justice system when he was 15 years old for, you guessed it, cannabis. So he was in the juvenile justice system, and then shortly thereafter, my parents split up. So there I was at six years old. I would lost one brother to death. Another brother was in the justice system, and my dad left home, and it was just me and my mom. Thankfully, I had a refuge because I was a pretty good athlete, and so I took refuge in sports. The great thing about sports is the rules of the game are fixed. And you either win or you lose. And that, that consistency was something I really craved as a child that was growing up in pretty traumatic circumstances. So I had a dream of being the next John McEnroe. And I practiced really hard to be a tennis player. And, uh, and that dream was going pretty well. I was ranked in the top 10 in my state uh, as a junior in high school. And then one day I was uh, playing a match and I felt and heard all this ripping in my lower back, and I injured myself pretty badly. And the doctor said, you can't play tennis for six months. Well, tennis is the kind of game that if you stop practicing for six months, you're going to get pretty far behind. And that was the end of my dream. There was no way at age 16 I was going to be able to be at the level one needs to be to be the next John McEnroe. Uh, <laughs> with a hurt back. And I was miserable, I was sad, I was depressed. And uh, I went to my mom's house, and she 
cook dinner for me, and my brother happened to be there, and of course he was smoking a joint uh, in the kitchen, and he said, you know, you should take some of this cannabis. It, it, you might feel better. Something deep within me said, yes, take that joint, Andrew. I don't know where that voice came from, but it was just within me. And I took the joint, I smoked the joint with my brother. And all of a sudden, about 10 minutes later, I wasn't sad anymore. <laughs> and I began to see that the world was bigger than just tennis and just sports. And that it was time for me as a young man to find myself and to step out of my athletic shell and to do something more meaningful with my life than just play sports. My older brother Steve was right there with that joint. I looked him in the eye and I said, Steve, let's legalize cannabis together. And from that day forward, my brother and I have been marching uh, arm in arm, hand in hand, on this journey together uh, to legalize cannabis. And the first thing I did was I wanted to get to know the plant. And, and the way that I did that, there was only two ways to do that in 1983. We didn't have any legal cannabis. Medical cannabis had not been uh, on the scene yet. You had to either grow it or you had to sell it. So I started selling weed in high school and advocating for the plant and learning everything I could about cannabis. The great work of this journey had begun for me all those many years ago. And Steve and I figured in 1983, oh, it's gonna take about 10 years to legalize cannabis all over the world and get everybody out of prison, 1983. We, we figured about 10 years, we're smart guys, it's, we know it's a good plant, not a bad plant, truth is on our side, how hard can this be? <laughs> well, we underestimated Ronald Reagan and Nancy Reagan. I'll just remind you what the world looked like in 1983, because I know sometimes it feels very frustrating right now and that we're in a very dark place, especially in places like Florida, even in California, the legal program's kind of a mess right now. But in 1983, with Ronald and Nancy Reagan at the helm, things were very dark indeed. They launched a drug war in 1980, just say no was happening. Nancy's big cause was just say no. The age of zero tolerance had begun. If you got caught with a joint or a roach, the penalties were getting more and more severe. We were introducing mandatory minimums and the mass incarceration, mostly of poor black and brown people, began in earnest. And by 1983, that was in full swing. <laughs> Cannabis lies were being told by all kinds of people in the Reagan administration. All kinds of lies. Cannabis makes you sterile. If you're a man, you'll go crazy. You won't be able to think right. You'll go insane. Your brain will rot. It's a gateway drug. If you smoke a joint today, tomorrow you'll die of a heroin overdose or a crack overdose. <laughs> the war on drugs was winning. Yeah. The war on drugs was kicking our asses and locking our people up. And even friends of my brother and I, who were in the cannabis business, they were getting locked up. Not just for a little while, for a long, long time. They were winning on all fronts, the legal front with the laws and the mandatory minimums, and then the workplace front. That's when this whole urinalysis testing started in the 1980s. We fought that. We felt that your urine was something that was private. It was your urine, it's not their urine, no one can look at it, it's a private thing, right? Well, we lost. We lost all the way in the Supreme Court, we lost that case. And even on the cultural front, we were losing. Does anybody remember that big movie in the 1980s, Clean and Sober, by Michael Keaton was the star of that movie? I'm probably outdating myself. But then, also there was a, after school special, you remember the Hallmark after school specials? There was one star in Scott Baio called Stone. Both of those pieces of propaganda scared the crap out of people. And on the cultural front, we were losing. It was a very, very dark time. 
Well, eventually I was able to go to college. I decided to leave the East Coast. I grew up in Washington, D.C., didn't like it there. And the promise of California was calling me. And so I went to college in California. I packed up a half pound of weed in my suitcase. In those days, you could actually do that and get on an airplane. <laughs> and I continued my work at the plant in college, uh, studying theater arts. I, I wanted to be the next <laughs> the next Dustin Hoffman, uh, now that uh, the John McEnroe dream was over. And so I studied. Graduated college with honors, smoking weed every day, all, all day. Uh, still graduated with honors. And I was a leader in my school. I was in the student government and uh, won awards, had a great time. And then I moved to LA to be a young actor. And my brother introduced me to a guy named Jack Harrow. Jack Harrow was working on his book, The Emperor Wears No Clothes. And if you don't know that book, you should get out your phone and buy it right now on Amazon.com. So I helped Jack with that project. Then I had the opportunity to move to San Francisco to go to a acting conservatory. And uh, there I met Dennis Perone. And this was 1990s. And Dennis Perone was helping very sick and dying men with AIDS. Uh, in San Francisco, we were in the middle of the AIDS crisis. And Dennis was giving away and selling cannabis to people that were very, 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 very sick, including his own partner who was dying of AIDS. And what we learned was that cannabis was helping folks. Cannabis was extending life. Cannabis was helping folks eat and get nourishment and get their appetite back. We didn't save their lives with cannabis oftentimes, but we did make the end a lot better, a lot more peaceful, and a lot less painful. Dennis, brilliant guy. He knew that the city of San Francisco had a ballot initiative process, and he was determined to get medical cannabis on the ballot in 1992, the very first time cannabis had ever appeared on the ballot. And of course, in the height of the AIDS crisis, we won. We won overwhelmingly in San Francisco, and Dennis was able to start his first dispensary in San Francisco, which I worked at and, and helped him with. And then we geared up for the state, Prop 215 in 1996, and I helped collect signatures for that effort, worked on the campaign, made a lot of phone calls, pounded a lot of pavement, and we won that vote by 59%, first time a state had flipped, and all of a sudden, our movement had some momentum, and it looked like the wind was at our backs. That same strategy of putting things on the ballot was repeated in many other states, all the way for the next 20 years, all the way right here in Florida. Yes, it took you twice to win, but when you won in 2016, you won with 71% of the vote, folks. That's the highest that's ever been done. All power to the people, yeah, right? Absolutely. All power to the people. So that's my cannabis journey. I'm sure you all have your own. And I'd like to just take a minute right now to get to know all of you a little bit. So by a show of hands, can you, anyone in here a patient or a doctor in the legal program right now here in Florida? All right, quite a few. Excellent. Any licensed operators? Any licensed operators? People in the industry right now? Excellent. Good. Um, investors? People? Yes. And how about entrepreneurs, business people who want to get in, who are dreaming about getting in? Yes, quite a few of those. Of course, this is uh, the place to be. And how about elected officials, regulators? I guess they didn't come to it. <laughs> they were invited. They were invited, yes. How about DEA agents? Any DEA agents <laughs> now? I'm sure you won't, uh, won't identify yourself if you won't. Uh, but in any case, if you're a patient or a doctor in this program, I just want to thank you for all your work and your bravery. You have led the way. Uh, the doctors are uh, in the beginning of any program in any state. The doctors are taking quite a bit of risk, right? 
So are the patients. It's not easy to go get legal in the state of Florida as a patient. Uh, I think it's got it's gotten easier, but it's still a pretty hard process. You have to register with state, you have to wait, you have to go through the doctor's processes, and it's hard. Uh, and patients are doing it. You're up to 150,000 patients right now, God. and uh, that's amazing. Uh, that's 150,000 legal patients uh, more than a couple years ago when you had zero. Uh, so all of you who are in that program uh, deserve a pat on the back. You are leading the way. For those of you that are operators, licensed operators already in the program, you are the pioneers that are leading the charge. This great work has already begun for you. You are operating. You are one plant at a time, one product at a time, one patient at a time, and one neighbor, a neighborhood and community at a time. You are serving the will of the people, and you're bringing this fantastic medicine to people who really, really need it. So good for you. Keep going. Let's get more operators licensed. Let's get more patients in the system. Let's build this thing. Investors, you are the fuel. You are the fuel that people like me need to build our models and to build our businesses, to figure out what experience in these retail locations or what types of plants or what types of products are going to work best. You are the fuel. Place your bets, diverse, diversify your investments is my word of advice to, to you. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Uh, there are, uh, it's a very risky business. What we do is hard and, and businesses do fail. Uh, so spread out those bets and continue to be courageous, continue to invest. We need you, that fuel is what's gonna get us to the next level. Uh, we've already seen it in other states and in, and, and in other places. And right here in Florida, you got licenses flipping for $100 million. So there must be some investors in the house, right? Entrepreneurs and dreamers, quite a few in here today. You're the future. You are the future. You are the innovators. You are the ones that are going to keep legacy people like me on our toes and honest so that we can improve and that we don't get complacent. The barriers of entry can be high. It can be hard. If those barriers of entry are too high for you right now, you don't have millions of dollars, use your voice to lower them. Use your voice to lower them. Build your vision as a business person. Make sure that you're putting your vision on paper, that you're testing it out. Go out and raise your capital. Find your investors. Find the fuel that's going to that's gonna feed your business. And if it's still out of reach for you, try going into an auxiliary business. You don't always have to touch the plan to succeed. Sometimes you can be in the packaging end of the business, the marketing end of the business, the consulting end of the business. There's a lot of places for us to plug into on this incredible value chain that we're creating. So find your spot, because there is no job that is too small for this. There is no job that is too small to propel us forward. Elected officials. Should be here, but they're not. Their job is to listen. They should be here listening to us right now and to learn and to follow the will of the people. And I encourage electeds and all of you to share the patient stories with elected officials. The patient stories are what's going to convert that elected official from the inside out. What we know about elected officials is that sooner or later, if you don't follow the will of the people, you're going to be out of the job. And that's what needs to happen here in Florida. If people are not following the will of the people in Tallahassee, we need to vote them out of office. Legalization is hard. The path is difficult. A hundred years of prohibition is in the muscle memory of America and in the muscle memory of Florida. Stigma persists. We earned 71% of the vote here. 
But have you earned their trust? We have to get communities on our side, not just earn their vote. It's not enough for us to be right. Of course we're right. We have to do good things. We have to demonstrate to our communities that cannabis is a good plant, not a bad plant. And if you embrace this in your community, it's going to bring more benefits to your communities than harms. And we have to be mindful of the harms. We don't want children getting into cannabis. We don't want pets getting into cannabis. We don't want anyone touching or consuming this plant, and we shouldn't be. So we have to be mindful. But we know that this is a good plant, and that communities are the ones on the ground that have to embrace it. So how? How do we go from getting a vote to getting trust? I think you have quite a few, few tools at your disposal. One, which I've learned a lot about in the last day or two, is litigation. So litigation is happening in Florida in a pretty big, pretty big way, right? Litigation's hard because it takes a long time. Not every case will get us to the, the place where we want to be. Some cases have more merits than others. But the court system is a really important tool for us because we have to sue people sometimes to get them to, to follow the will of the people. And sometimes we have to take people to court. The, the courts are a check and balance to the legislative bodies and the executive branches of our government. We have a free branch government system, and the courts are a powerful check and balance. So we do have to use the courts. And if you're an attorney in this room, and you're fighting those fights, and you're doing that litigation, we love you. How can we help? How can we support? Because you've taken a big risk as a lawyer. Remember, lawyers take a vow that they will not ever break the law or encourage anyone to break the law. So lawyers are taking quite a bit of risk by litigating these cases and, and trying to open up this program with, with lawsuits. I will tell you that 71% holds up pretty good in court. So I think you've got the wind in your back. The ballot box is another really powerful tool. We have to keep using it, uh, whether that be uh, making sure elected officials are following the will of the people. And if they are, we say yes, and we vote for them. If they are not, we say no, and we don't vote for them, and we vote for their opponent, who will embrace the will of the people. Make cannabis a major issue in these campaigns. Make it so that they cannot ignore cannabis. Elected officials always want to push it under the rug, not talk about it, and want to talk about something else, make them talk about it. Make them hear the patient's stories. Take those patients to them. Make sure that they understand the stakes are high for our community and that they need to get off their asses and do something about it. Education and grassroots activism, I think, starts with the patient's story. The previous panel, we had a couple of formal NFL players that are making documentary films. They're telling their stories. <coughs> the kids with epilepsy. You might have remembered a little program I, me and my brother were on called Weed Wars. It was the first uh, reality television program about a California cannabis company, about any cannabis company. And in that program, I was the very first cannabis leader to give a child with epilepsy a tincture. And that young child's name was Jaden. And Jaden is still taking cannabis tincture. He's doing great. He's growing up. He's going to school. He can swim with his friends. He can start to talk a little bit. And he's starting to live a normal life. That story was picked up by CNN and Sanjay Gupta. The Stanley brothers did, it took what we learned with Jason and Jaden and uh, scaled it up in Colorado. Sanjay Gupta covered that. And then very quickly after that documentary aired on CNN, what we saw was a lot of states flipping their laws. Even very conservative states had to introduce a CBD law, right? Even Georgia, um, very conservative state. 
So that story of Jade and uh, of Charlotte and uh, the Canamoms right here in Florida, Giselle and Bruno and some of the other kids here in Florida who get help from cannabis, those stories are very powerful. And they erode that muscle memory of prohibition from the inside out because we touch people in the heart. And when you touch people in the heart, it influences the mind. The press, the press is the platform where we tell the stories, right? We need the press on our side. And by and large, from what I've experienced the last 12 years, the press is pretty much with us. Sometimes not so much, but most of the time. And they play an important role in getting the story out, putting pressure on elected officials, and informing the community of how powerful cannabis can be and, and how beneficial cannabis can be for our communities. I think our most powerful tool are good operators, right? Businesses that work in the legal market. If you're cultivating and producing and dispensing really great products and you're creating wonderful experiences for patients, they're gonna go tell their friends and their family that, hey, this is a great thing. Did you hear what these, this dispensary over here is doing? You gotta check it out, they're amazing. By doing good work every day, day in and day out, one patient at a time, one neighbor at a time, we start to change the narrative. You have 150,000 patients. I hear you're adding about 3,000 a week. You're gonna have a lot more by the end of the year. A year from now, you may have a quarter million patients in the program. And you have 21 million people in this state. That means every patient only has to talk about 140 people before everybody in the state is converted and everybody believes in this. And then you have a real mandate. You get from 71 to 100%. 96, 97 maybe. There's always going to be a few holdouts uh, in the old way. And as we build these businesses, as we tell these stories, as they're covered in the press, as we win our lawsuits, we begin to build trust. We begin to change that muscle memory from cannabis is a bad plant to cannabis is a good plant. And then you have some leaders here in Florida, guys like John Morgan, and, and that are very well financed people who are standing behind the program, who are trying to open it up. I hear that uh, you may get adult use on the ballot soon, and guys like John Morgan are going to help you do that. And so we have to leverage our leaders and make sure that they're engaged and participating. Harborside also learned a lot about how to navigate this process. When we opened in 2006, October of 2006, it was a very different environment. Oakland was the only city that had an ordinance. It was the only place that you could get a license. Most of the state of California had banned it. People were afraid. Our neighbors didn't trust us. Law enforcement didn't trust us. Law enforcement thought we were a bunch of criminals who had, who had gained the system and gotten a license, and now it was legal for us to, to deal weed. Uh, so they, they, they were not really invested in us yet. We didn't have any statewide regulations, and our community in Oakland had been burned by bad operators who were moving a lot of bulk weed out the back door and doing all kinds of terrible, nefarious things. The community, essentially, when we opened our doors, was waiting for us to fail. And we didn't have their trust, and we could feel it. And we were afraid that if, if we made one mistake or one bad thing happened, we'd be shut down and the program would end and some terrible press would be told against us and it would hurt everybody in the state, it would hurt the whole program. So we knew we had to build trust. The first thing we did was we went to the city of Oakland and we said, you need to tax us. That was 
a little bit risky, it's a slippery slope, now my taxes are too high, but in those days, it gave the community some skin in the game. And I know Florida is a low tax state, and, and, and that's great, but one of the things that taxes do on our businesses is it gives community skin in the game, it creates interdependency, and it helps us build trust. The second thing we did was uh, work on edibles. In those days, most of the edibles were, were being manufactured in people's garages or home kitchens. They were being put into Ziploc bags, uh, barely any, just, just the sticker on it that said Prop 215 is, is for medical patients only. Oh my goodness. Nobody knew what was in them. You didn't know how strong they were, had no idea what the milligram dosages were, and the packaging was, was, was not appropriate. So we went to our vendors and we said, listen, if you want to sell your edibles at Harborside, you have got to put your edible into an opaque package that's child-proof, at least on the first pack. The vendors hated it. They wanted to kill us. Sure. It cost them more money, right? But we said, we're not going to sell it unless you do that. And you know what? They did it. And then when I toured elected officials through there, and I showed them the, the new childproof packaging, they were happy. They relaxed a little bit. It gave them a little bit of cover, right? So that was the best practice we discovered, and we quickly saw that it gained trust in our community. The next big thing we did was lab testing. So there was no lab testing in California, there was no lab testing in Proposition 215, there was no lab testing in the Oakland Ordinance or Program. So when Steve and I took cannabis flowers to about six or seven labs said no, being the entrepreneurs we are, we said, well, better start our own lab. So we did. We started Steve Hill Lab. Steep Hill Labs, I'm proud to say, is still around today. We don't have any ownership interest in it anymore because it's very important that the labs are a third party and arm's length and there isn't any conflict between dispensaries or producers and labs. But the lab testing really was a game changer. In those days, all we could test for was mold and pathogens and potency. But patients loved it. Patients love seeing that information. And elected officials and the press, boy, they loved it too. And all of a sudden, we realized that, wow, this lab testing thing is, is pretty powerful. And so we kept doing it. Again, the vendors didn't like it very much, right? The growers didn't like it because if one of your samples failed, it was pretty painful. But the community felt more trust having that lab testing. In, in those days, the California program was nonprofit. One of the things the state said is we don't want any profits in 215. So we're going to make this a nonprofit program. That did change on January 1st of this year. But Steve and I leveraged that nonprofit status to invest in our community. The first thing we did from day one was we had free holistic services that we offered our Patient. So you could come in on Harborside, you could buy some medical cannabis. If you couldn't afford it, we had a care package program, we'd give it to you for free. Wow. And then you could also get a free yoga class, free acupuncture, free red K, free counseling, free substance abuse services. Because we want to make sure there's always a few people who get in trouble with cannabis and can't control their use. They misuse it. We wanted them to be able to come in and talk to somebody. Or if you're addicted to pharmaceuticals, we wanted folks to be able to come in and get counseling for that. That also helped build a lot of trust. People were blown away. What are these guys doing giving free holistic services away? What are they, communists? <laughs> but no, we just really wanted people to be well. And we wanted to demonstrate that wellness, cannabis is part of a wellness lifestyle. It's a part of it. But there's other things we have to do to be well, right? We have to have a good diet, we have to exercise, we have to do yoga, we have to, we have to get other kinds of health services. We can't just rely on cannabis. And then we did a lot of charity work. 
We had another program called the Patient Activist Resource Center for low-income folks. If they needed to uh, get some cannabis for their ailment, they'd come in, they'd write a letter to a prisoner, they write a letter to an elected official wow. and give them a gram of cannabis in exchange wow. for doing that. We generated over 10,000 letters to prisoners and over 5,000 letters to elected officials. It was a great program. I can't do that program anymore because the state and the new program, the new adult use program, won't let me give anything away for free. Oh. But all of these things we were able to do. And they worked, they built trust in our community, and they gave us a, a bigger and better story to tell. Twelve years later, we passed adult use last uh, in November of 2016, the same election that you passed your medical program here. It's a difficult transition from going from medical to adult use. We have a for-profit system now. We have very high, high taxes in California. Oh my God. <laughs> um, and we have uh, onerous regulation where we're now over-regulating things like packaging and, and labeling. And things are hard. But the trust is there. And in about 60% of the communities in California, people believe that cannabis is a good plant, not a bad plant. We still have another 40% to go. But over the last 12 years, we went from zero to 60%. Just as you have gone in the last couple of years from 58 to 71, right? So it took us 20 years in California to get from a medical program to an adult use program. I hope it doesn't take 20 years here in Florida. And when I learn about Florida, I learn that it's really hard right now. But I'm also really proud of Florida. You are the first southern state, <laughs> the first state south of the Mason-Dixon line, to in a very serious way take this on. You're doing it. We are. You've won the law. You've got 71%. You've got a mandate. The wind is at your back. You're going to legalize adult use here in Florida, and you will be the first southern state, I believe, to do that. And that's something to be unanimously <coughs> proud of. So may the great work begin for you all. Let's let this plant grow far and wide throughout the state of Florida, throughout the entire country. Let's prove to the world that cannabis is a good plan, not a bad plan. Thank you. No. I don't know if we do we have time for questions? Anybody have a question for a D'Angelo? Yes. I have a question. So you work in retail and so you must see a lot of products and different offerings. Where do you think the innovation is happening right now in the industry as far as that's a great question. Thank you. Great question. Right um, well, we're starting to see some innovation in the other cannabinoids, like CBN. Um, CBN is a is a is, is is a great cannabinoid for sleep. So you're starting to see CBN products. We carry uh, Mary's Medicinals. Does anyone know Mary's Medicinals? That's a that's a, a, a company that makes transdermal patches. They're now making capsules, CBD capsules, and CBN capsules. We're carrying them at Harborside. Um, we're starting to see, uh, we just had a, the Lagunitas Beer Company just partnered with a group called Canacraft in California, and they're making a 10 milligram tonic, carbonated tonic that has, is made with hops. So that drink just hit the market about a week or two ago, and I can't keep it on our shelves. And so I think people are starting to find different ways and taste profiles to deliver cannabis. We're restricted in California on how many milligrams we can put into edibles products. Uh, so you're seeing a lot of innovation on that too. And the market is just changing, you know. The, the, most of the heavy consumers and the medical patients that were coming into my shop a year ago 
they're all going to the black market right now, unfortunately, because the taxes are too high and the prices are too high. So I'm seeing a lot of new users and new adapters, folks that have never come into a dispensary before, about 25% of my business now, are people that have never been to Harborside before. Uh, so we have to educate those folks. Uh, those folks tend to like edibles and vape pen cartridges more than they like flour. Um, and we're still seeing a lot of sales in tinctures, capsules, um, and products like that. So I think that we'll, we'll begin to see more and more cannabinoids like CBN come online. Um, and I think you'll start to see more formulations, right? All, you have all these tinctures and formulations now that have a certain amount of CBD and a certain amount of THC. I think we'll, we'll begin to see that also with CBN and some of the other cannabinoids. So I think that that's re really, re really where the innovation is. It's tough right now because in California, um, you, we're going through this moment where a lot of the artists and producers that do a lot of the innovative products are, are, are struggling to participate in, in the system. Uh, and, and there is a somewhat of an extinction event going on with those folks because they can't get licensed because the barriers of entry are too high. I expect that to change as we lower the barriers of entry, uh, uh, some of those artists and producers will start innovating again. It's really hard to be innovative when you've got a giant complex that you have to keep the lights and the trains running on time. And uh, so we, we, I think we'll see the bell curve kind of go to big producers and the supply chain will be sort of a lot of mediocre products. Doesn't mean they won't be innovative, it's just they'll be scaled, right? And then at some point, the artists and producers will, will, people will get tired of the mid-grade weed out there on the market and they're gonna want something a little bit nicer, a little bit more care has been put into it. So I, I, I see the artisans coming back at that point. I, I just have one follow-up quick question. So based on that last comment, do you find people will pay the premiums for a premium product? Yes. Definitely? Yes. Would you repeat the question? Uh, the question was, if you know if it, it, it costs more and the taxes are high so the, the price of the products are actually going up especially the really good stuff right because it's being produced in smaller batches and it's uh, got lower supply and of course all of us who love cannabis know that you always try to get the best cannabis you possibly can right you try to get the highest quality that your wallet can afford that day um, be, because most of us if, if you only have twenty dollars left in your pocket and you need gas in your car and you need cannabis, yeah. most people I know are gonna buy the cannabis and they're gonna, <laughs> they're gonna put a gallon of gas in their car and they're gonna spend 18 bucks on, or 17 bucks on cannabis. <laughs> so um, I think that, that that trend will continue. So, you know, one of the things that happened, in, right, in July 1st, we had this new regulations, new lab testing requirements, new packaging requirements, and all of a sudden, some really good weed came on uh, the market, but it was expensive, you know, $62 an eighth, plus the taxes, almost $100 an eighth. Couldn't keep it on the shelf. It was really good. It was really good. How good was it? Well, <laughs> couch locked me for an evening. Um, anybody else? Yes. Uh, with regards to sales, would you say edibles um, sells more than the flour or? Right now, yes. Yeah. Right now, edibles are about 30%, carts are about 30%, flowers about 20, 25%, and then my capsules, my tinctures uh, make up the rest. We also sell clones and seeds at Harborside, so that makes up about 5% of my sales right now. California, we encourage people to grow their own, right? Especially with high taxes. Yes? Absolutely, there's going to be oversupply. Quickly, do you see that? Well, that's a good question. We're seeing it in Oregon already. There's a terrible oversupply problem in Oregon. I predict that the same thing's going to happen in Canada, um, and uh, it's going to happen in California. The principal reason for that is the retail part of the supply chain is the hardest to license, 
not so much because of the state, but because of local people. So I'm sure here in Florida, you probably have local communities that have banned it. Um, same thing in California. And, and, and so, and even when they don't ban it and they have a program to license a retail facility, it takes a long time, you know? You have to have the public hearings, you have to find a building, you have to renovate the building, you have to build it out, you have to buy your inventory, you have to let the world know you're there and that you're open. So the retail end of the supply chain is very hard to get going. Uh, and so that creates overproduction upstream because there's not enough outlets for that legal product to go into. But even if there were, don't you think there's still too much, too many growth facilities that are being created over there? Or no? If the retail problem is solved. If the retail problem is solved, I don't see that. But remember, in December, we had about 1,400 dispensaries in California. We have 400 now. So it went from 1,400 to 400. Whenever that happens, you're going to have a bloodbath upstream. Now, we just had some new testing requirements that include pesticides. Uh, so a lot of folks are failing those tests right now. Yeah. So it's not as big a problem, uh, but I expect those farms to clean themselves up and they'll be clean soon. And, and then, you know, I'm, I worry very much about overproduction and a crash in prices because whenever you have overproduction, there is risk of diversion, and whenever you have diversion, there's a risk that you know prohibition will rear its ugly head again. So we have to be very mindful of that. It's still here. It, with vertical corporations in Florida, how can any small grower or artisan, as you all have in California, expect to come out here and make a dime? Well, you can't. You can't. Yeah. You can't. Right so now. who's doing all that compliance gathering that we all have to go through? Yeah, it's it's really hard for s smaller folks in a program like Florida. Also, right now in California, it's harder too. Now, one of the things I've learned about artisan cannabis producers is they're pretty resilient folks, pretty determined folks, uh, and pretty adaptable folks. Just stay at it. You know, like I said earlier, you, you got to do, we have to lower these barriers to entry. And uh, we have to do our political work, we have to do our activism work, we have to tell all those stories, and, and we have to let communities know that if we lower these barriers to entry, the sky is not going to fall upon everybody's head. Uh, and that's going to take a little time. Community outreach. That's right, community outreach, yes. Can you, uh discuss each say again can you discuss the challenges in terms of banking and financial services yeah wow what a problem <laughs> um, it's hard to get a bank account if you're a cannabis business even here in Florida I read the story about the woman who's running for ag commissioner I think they can't read she got her Wells Fargo account right. shut down. Right. She doesn't touch the plant. She's not even in the business, right? Right. Um, so if you're banking with Wells Fargo now, I encourage you to switch to a different bank. Yep. Um, we have to send a message to those people and they can't do that sort of thing to an elected official. Really? Really? Um, so it's, it's a big problem. Uh, my advice is credit unions, um, institutions that are not FDIC insured, a little bit more open sometimes. Local institutions, a little bit more open sometimes. You know, over the 12 years of Harborside, we've gone through, I don't know, half a dozen banks or so. Um, and I know, I think Hardcar has a booth here. Um, Hardcar um, uh, is uh, a group that does transportation. They also help people with banking services. Can pay? Um, Can pay? The app? CanPay, we use at Harborside. CanPay is basically um, uh, an app you have on your phone that you load money onto, and then you come to the dispensary, and, and the funds get transferred from that third-party platform into, into our register. Um, it works. Um, it's a little bit burdensome on people. You have to you know, transfer money to the app. And, but we use it, and it's, it's effective. I think it's a, it's a good workaround for now. Um, you know, the big problem with credit cards, you, uh, they, you can't get credit cards, you can't pay for your cannabis with credit cards, you can't use any 
uh, credit cards. That's very hard, especially on delivery services. We have a delivery uh, uh, service at Harborside, and we can't take credit cards. We can't prepay for those delivery orders, so our drivers have to take cash at the door or debit card. We do have a debit card. Um, but you know, you know how mobile debit card machines don't work a lot, um, and so oftentimes we're sitting there trying to get the debit card to work, and we're not in a hot spot or whatever, and we can't get it to work. So financial services are incredibly constrained. We got to wrap up. Okay, maybe one more. Have you uh, have you looked into Bitcoin at all, or Bitcoin? Oh. Or any crypto I, I, we don't do Bitcoin, um, not because I don't want to do Bitcoin. I just don't understand it. Um, <laughs> and, and, um, uh, but but I know that there are, are like High Times Magazine is is selling shares to they folks are, right now, and they'll take Bitcoin apparently. They are, no, they can't. They stopped. They stopped it. Okay. Uh -huh. So I, uh, I think that either. you know crypto cryptocurrencies. I don't I don't have a lot of expertise in, so I can't really talk about them too much. Right now, we're not taking them, but conceptually, I wouldn't have a problem with that. My problem is okay. So I've got all this Bitcoin in my account, and then my landlord says the rent's due, and I can't pay her with Bitcoin. Right. And so it's like, oh, what am I going to do with it all? You know, it's a, it's a little bit of a problem. One more question. Yes. Right? So we've got Truly, Vitacan, Pantera, um, you know, I'm sure we'll see all the time. Yes. So if they had a crystal ball and if they knew that they were going to get broken up and now they have the ability to carry each other's products, would it be a good idea to do that voluntarily before the vertical? Sure. I mean, um, I, I, I don't see any downside to, to sharing your products across the, the different vertical businesses. Um, I like horizontal. Yeah, so um, I like open markets, but yeah. I, like, I mean, you know how constrained it is. There are no products. I mean, there are their products. But... Yeah, I do. I mean, uh, none of us are touching the planet or making a lot of money right now. Um, we're, we're spending a lot, but we're not, we're not making a lot. Um, and um, I like horizontal. Um, horizontal is better for the consumer. It's uh, better for the patient. It's more innovative. It creates more competition. What I worry about here in Florida is you have this vertical system. You have these licenses that are going for an insane amount of money. These folks are investing. Part of the reason it's $100 million to get a license here is because it's vertical. Right. So if the state decides to go horizontal, then all these people are going to sue. And there's going to be all kinds of litigation from these huge investments that have been made in the vertical. And then I, I just worry that it's gonna lock the system up and you might get injunctions on things from the courts and it could be a real quagmire. Uh, 280E. So, oh boy, that's a whole nother talk. <laughs> that's a whole nother talk. But uh, it looks like we're out of time and we have to get on to the next <coughs> panel. I really enjoyed being with you.